I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the prophet of the restoration and founder of the LDS Church, the church I served as a bishop for five years. I knew the church was true. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. My life has been built on certain truths, but wishing doesn't change the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. When I finally learned the truth about the real history and doctrines of Mormonism, I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have come to learn that many others have made a similar journey out of the bondage of religion and into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about. Courageous people who want to share their story, hoping that you, the viewer, will discover the same new life in Jesus. So if you're a Latter-day Saint who is struggling with questions or seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we invite you to join us tonight. We have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Hi, and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I appreciate you spending time with us again and, and uh, hearing our, these wonderful stories, and they're so heartfelt and, and just fascinating. And as you know, we're in our third and final uh, visit with uh, Sherry Philos, who's Mitchell Philos, who's mm -hmm. been willing to come from Nashville, Tennessee, and share her story. And we have a, a real upbeat kind of a message here at the uh, in our final session. So, Sherry, thanks so much. We've mentioned actually at the beginning that, um, and, and if you've been listening, you know about this. But in our last one, we kind of learned that she had. Uh, uh, she's been a singer in a rock band. Yeah. Yeah. Wrote, write songs yeah. and, mm -hmm. and a guitar player and everything. Yeah. And uh, came out to BYU Law School and uh, graduated from the law school, went back to Massachusetts to study law, mm -hmm. found your current husband. Mm -hmm. Did you think you were going to convert him? I did. Was that kind of in the back of your mind? I thought the spirit was going to convert him. Sure. And I thought once he got did converted. Did he ever take the lessons? Actually, yeah, he sat down with the missionary several times, yeah. and we would start into the lessons, and they would start talking about how only men had ever been called as prophets, and I would interrupt them, and I would say, ah, ah, well, you know, you're wrong. <laughs> Deborah, yeah. don't forget Deborah. Yeah. Of course, most of them had never read the Bible. No, they, didn't they didn't know about know Deborah. That. Yeah. That's so, fast. but yeah, and we wouldn't, we just wouldn't get very far into wow. the lessons. And he just he knew what he he knew what he, where he was coming from, and he had some confidence in in his Christian walk, I guess. So well, yeah. that's interesting. Yeah, he did. Yeah. Now, what were you? Uh, you were still being active, or you were still active back was there? Was very and, active. Yeah. yeah. Very active. Every Sunday, we all went to church. And he even joined you many times. Many times, a, he yeah. was the main commenter in okay. gospel doctrine. Now, you mentioned earlier that you had run for city council yeah. and won, yep. and you did that. Was, that. was there any religious kind of experience with, with that or um, anything not, that you recall? Oh, yeah. The second time around, I was specific. The, the Lord pretty much said, don't run again. Oh, a sec the the second, second term? Time. Okay. Yeah, and I ignored it. Uh. Because my friends on the council said, oh, you have to run. We need you. You must run. I said, okay, I'll run. They Even need me. Even though God said that you probably <laughs> that you shouldn't be running. Huh? <laughs> yeah, I, I didn't really listen. Uh. And two weeks before the election, Spirit said, you're going to lose. And I said, oh, thanks. Okay, I won't do any more. <laughs> And I stopped campaigning. And all of these experiences, I guess, you you see God's hand in all of these uh, yeah. experiences, your BYU yeah. time. And At that time, I was reading a lot of church history. Yeah. And... What was striking you? you? You mentioned all the discoveries that you were making about facts. And I, th I would assume as an attorney, your critical thinking that you've developed that even to a greater extent than probably a lot of us. And what were what was bothering you or in the well? Were there what was bothering that, me was that we claimed to be a restored church, but yet 
there were things that just weren't rational to me. For example, you know, the, the, the idea that women had to ask an ex-husband's permission to get a, t a temple ceiling cancellation, uh, to me that was irrational. Uh, and and the, because it seemed to me, okay, does that mean that once a woman is married to a man, she is his property? Because to me, that's what that means. Yeah. If you have to get, get a permission, permission yeah. from your ex-husband for a, for a temple cancellation, that means in reality, no matter what they say, that by virtue of the fact that you were married, you were his property. Not that he was your property, because they don't make the women get, uh, they don't make the man get permission from the woman. Oh, they don't? They, have you ever heard of that? <laughs> Well, I, I guess I should know that, but so they don't require the woman? I don't woman? think so. Oh, I don't I mean, know. I mean, not that I know of. It was always in my, maybe maybe I'm wrong, but yeah. it seemed to me. Somebody will correct us, maybe. Yes, correct us if we're wrong. Yeah. But I've only ever heard of Well, women. yeah, because they can be married to more than one person. Exactly. Yeah, back to the polygamy. Exactly. And in polygamy, and you mentioned your background in the Bartle family. Right. But uh, it almost was property. Yeah. The woman was treated, I mean, Brigham Young but, has many but, quotes about But how. that wasn't what I was thinking. What I oh. was thinking went back more to law school. Yeah. Because when, when we learned about uh, partnerships, <laughs> you don't, in law school, yeah. we learned that you don't have a full partnership unless both partners have the right the same rights and responsibilities as the other partner, right? Right. Full, so it seemed to full me full and equal, and, yes, and balanced, okay. right? That although women do not have a full partnership with a man in an LDS marriage if they do not have the same rights, and they don't, and they don't. Yeah, it's obvious, and it's because of polygamy, because whenever you have and the priesthood? Well, and the priesthood is tied to polygamy. Sure. I don't think it has yeah. to be, but it is, yeah. you know. Um, but I mean, that same mentality, I think, exists <clears throat> even in the mainstream church. Right. <clears throat> that, and and uh, they used to justify polygamy. Of course, I used to justify. I was a big polygamy apologist uh, because because it's in the New Testament, uh, Old Testament. But the problem with the Old Testament, or bringing up that it was in the Old Testament, is that they teach falsehoods. I remember uh, a hearing in Gospel Doctrine that Hagar was a wife of Abraham. And then doing my own study and discovering, oh no, she was not, she was not a wife. She, was, she was a servant. She was a slave. Yeah. And that's the reason Never why... Never required by God. No. In fact, it was Sarah's idea. Well, right. yeah, try not to get me off track here. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> I'm on a track. Okay. Right. So um, if you do some digging around, you learn that in the old, in the ancient culture, uh, and I'm not sure if it's just the Hebrew culture or if it's the Semitic culture of Mesopotamia, servants giving birth and having master's wives adopt children was a way, uh, it was a form of surrogate parenthood, but it had boundaries and limitations. For example, uh, if the servant fell out of favor with the master's wife, or her, wi her, her okay. master, yeah, yeah. The, master, the master's wife or her master did not have to catch the baby. At the baby's birth, the baby could be, bo could be sold as a slave. Okay, um, that is not on the same level as a wife. Okay, no, completely for sure. different status. Right. So if you go to Jacob, for example, and Leah and Rachel are in this competition, giving their servants as wives, wives. to Jacob. Right. They they still don't have the same status. They only as a wife, no, they're servants. They're servants. Okay. And the only reason why they can be treated as well as they are, it, it's really up to the discretion of the master the who master. was the wife yeah. to treat her servant as well as she chooses to treat her. For example, when Bilha slept with Reuben, okay, uh, Jacob could have had them stoned, 
Leah could have had them stoned. I mean, they were property. No, I mean, obviously not yeah. Reuben, right? right? Uh, but Bilhah easily could have been stoned for that. She was a servant. Now, as a wife, she probably could have been stoned as well. The fact of the matter was, she wasn't stoned. Right. Um, and it was only because of the goodness of... Reuben? Reuben. Well, no, Jacob at the time. Oh, Jacob. Yeah. Uh, Bilhah was a concubine. So, in reality, those plural wives were not wives at all. They were slaves, concubines, sexual slaves. Yeah. Okay? And that isn't accurate. It's just what they teach for gospel doctrine and in Sunday schools is not accurate at all. Yeah. And wanna, when I discovered that, things, huh? I was upset. Yeah. <laughs> I'm thinking, you guys have been teaching the wrong thing all this time. And a divorce attorney would know some of those things. <laughs> well, and it was upsetting because it explains a lot of the reason why Sarah was upset with Hagar the way she was right. and why she had the legal right to send Hagar off, have uh, Abraham send Hagar off the way he did. Yeah. She, because Hagar was her servant. Okay. Yeah. So you're back in Massachusetts. We've got you there. Yeah. You're you've married a Christian. Yeah. And he has a bit of a family, and you have a. He has a bit three of kids. I have five kids. Okay. Together we have eight and kids. So, uh, and they all come to church them. with us to the Mormon church after oh a while. Yeah. yeah. So what happens in in your life at, at this point? Okay. So what happens is, more and more, I'm learning things that shake my confidence in the church and what the church has presented as not only doctrine but the historical story of its origin. Now is this 2010, 2011, 2012 in that area? It's about 2012. I lost the election in, tw in uh, 2011. Okay. And I had a lot more time. <laughs> <laughs> to study. A little bit more time. Yeah. As much time as you can have. With, with kids. With as and, many kids as we have in yeah. the situation with, you know, yeah. our housing and all that stuff. So um, I'm reading and I'm finding out things. And I still have faith in the goodness of the church and the goodness of the people. Yeah. But I'm losing faith in the accuracy of the history and the motivation, like what could motivate people, what could motivate a church to lie about its history? Yeah, let's talk about that for a minute because you're in the law. Yeah. You know what it takes for someone to stand before a judge and to tell a lie or tell, Be honest. don't tell all the truth. Right. Uh, you swear to tell the truth, nothing but the truth. And you're sensing and seeing that the church doesn't tell all the truth. Well, I think what was so upsetting was knowing how the church puts its members under such pressure to be honest. But I'm realizing the church itself has no such pressure to be honest. Oh boy. And that is disturbing to me, yeah. very, very disturbing. And I defended the church so much. There were so many times over the years I defended the church. I had a friend who was attacking the church on Facebook yeah. And I said some things which shut her down right away because it bothered me that she was attacking the church. I understand you have a difference with the church, yeah. but say your difference. Don't, you don't have to attack the church to say your difference with the church. Yeah. And so I, I, I defended the church and lost my friend, oh. you know. Um, have you gone back to her? You probably should. Uh, <laughs> Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. Yeah. Think about that. Pray about yeah. that. Yeah. But um, so it was, it was, uh, I, I was coming to a point where it, it was, things were really bothering me. Mm -hmm. And I talked to Kevin about these things. I talked to my husband, but I was still going to church. And then we decided to move to Tennessee. Okay. Now, as you recall, Tennessee is the buckle of the Bible Belt. Yeah. And I was thrilled to be living around people who love Jesus. Now, again, what's interesting is that for me, when I would go to my Temple Recommend interview, I was disturbed by the lack of focus on Jesus and so much focus on propping up men 
Uh, Joseph Smith, Joseph Smith and the restoration and, and the, the prof current, prophets. current prophets because it seemed to me the focus should should have been on Jesus always on Jesus yeah, yeah. And, and did you sense that in other talks and things that you would hear at church and so it on it came to a head in Tennessee okay I wasn't so much bothered at this point about that so much until I started really reading the New Testament okay. it was a little bother yeah. it was like a little eh, but there were so many other things like the treatment of women, blah, blah, blah. And I wasn't even, I, it wasn't even, I wasn't pushing for women to have the priesthood or anything. No, yeah. I just, yeah, okay. So we moved to Tennessee and I decided to read the New Testament. Reading the New Testament on my own, not with anybody else. Yeah. Reading the New Testament created a whole new understanding for me of Jesus his mission, and my relationship to him. I didn't read the King James Version. I read the New English Translation. And I thought, hallelujah, I can understand it. I don't need to take a class in Shakespearean <laughs> language to understand it. Yeah. Because that's what you pretty much need to do if you're going to read the well, King like James Version. Some have said we have learned a little bit since 1611 with yes. the King James and so yes. the Greek and, and the I Hebrew. And I love and... all the translations that are out there yeah. because if you don't really understand one thing, you can compare it to different translations yeah. and you can get the gist of and it so much better. And the words may be a little different, but the message is there. Right. Yeah, I agree. Right. And that's where I got into Paul, but my eyes were first opened when Jesus is talking to his apostles his apostles come running to him saying master master there's people over there and they're baptizing in your name and casting out devils in your name but they're not part of our group go tell them to stop right yeah that's what they wanted right yeah and he turns to them and says very diplomatically those who are not against us are for us <laughs> and that one scripture right there kind of destroyed any notion that there is one true, true church. church. The whole believing world of Christianity is his church. And that is backed up. That, that interpretation is backed up by that scripture where two or three are gathered in my name. Don't you love that? There will I be also. Yeah. Yeah. No need for a restoration. Nope. Yeah. And I also started learning about... Um, other great Christians throughout the ages, uh, St. Patrick. Yeah. And I'm thinking the Lord worked through him to convert the entire pagan island of Ireland <laughs> to Christianity. So God's been working. Oh my goodness. God yeah. never stopped working. Right. But we And we have that sense in Mormonism that it all started. It all started and with then all us. of a sudden and all of a sudden right. eighteen twenty happens and it starts over. Yeah. Oh, but the funniest thing is that they, they're starting to teach, or maybe they always did teach, Adam had the same doctrine that we had. Yeah. Abraham had the same gospel we yeah. have. Yeah. Really? Not supported. Yeah. Okay. So you have uh, one thing that you mentioned before is that you as you start studying and seeing, seeing these different things, you, you really didn't have anybody to talk to? No. I did not have anybody to talk to. And because it was, you can't really bring anything up no. in church. And it was like wave after wave of things. Just you were reading learning? the New Testament. Yeah. yeah. Grace? Paul. Yeah. Grace. The Gospel of Grace. Yes. When I, and we didn't know that as more, or we don't know that as Mormons, do And we? his lectures against the law. That really hit me over the head like a ton of bricks, because of had, course... Had you understood that before? Oh, no. No. Not like that. No. No. But of course, um, being an attorney, yeah. and then understanding the Old Testament, and and how how Paul's talking about the Old Testament. And the Pharisees and the Sadducees. But it's like the scales fell from my eyes. Really? And I saw the LDS religion in a new light. I saw the LDS religion as a, as a reincarnation of the Old Testament. Yeah. Living the law. Yes. Yeah. Very much. And the and the New Testament speaks and Paul particularly speaks against, against works that. and the law. And that doesn't mean that works aren't important, but we do works because we believe in Jesus Christ and mm. he has saved us. We mm. do it out of a sense of gratitude and love, and love for him and our for fellow him. men. 
Right. What's the great commandment? Love God. Not out of a sense of fear that, oh my gosh, if I don't do enough, I'm not going to make it. And you must have felt that through your life, the guilt and... Oh, especially as a... All falling short. Twice divorced woman. Oh, yes. And not not measuring up. I never measured up. Oh. No, I couldn't measure up. So sorry. No, it's okay. But now there's freedom. Yes. Your sense of freedom. I love it. And a joy. I love it. Yeah. But let's talk about the final straw. Let's do it. Let's talk about the final straw. How much time do we have? This is fascinating. Go ahead. We got plenty of time. Okay. So... I was trying to figure out how to stop going to the LDS, to, to my ward. <sighs> my temple recommend was going to run out the end of the year. Well, it was actually the, uh, you know, the end of the month, the first month of the next year. This is January my, 2016. Yes. My daughter was getting married in the temple in, in, in Timpanogos, and I had supported her all the way along. She'd been on a mission. She'd been on a mission. Yeah. I had two kids go on missions. Okay. And all this is kind of coming to a head. So the final straw came when the last Sunday when we left Tennessee, my ward in Tennessee, I heard a regurgitated general authority talk given by a lay member where the lay member quoted the talk and in the talk was a parable. Of course, I knew that was a parable told by Jesus. Of course, I knew that, right? Not once did the member giving the talk attribute the parable to Jesus. Not once in the talk given by the general authority did the general authority attribute it to Jesus. Maybe he just told the talk badly. I don't know. But either way, the result was the same. No no mention mention. of Jesus. (laughs) I'm thinking, hmm, that's interesting. I find that rather offensive. But I'm not going to say anything. So we went to um, Utah. For the, for the wedding, wedding. For the wedding. And we attend two sacrament sessions there in different wards. Same exact talk. In each ward? Sa- yes. Same exact general authority. Same exact parable. No mention of Jesus. And I'm thinking, no, this is wrong. <laughs> you people are losers. How can you talk about the parable and not mention Jesus? It's crazy. And I thought, that's it. I'm not going anymore. That's a sign. (laughs) (laughs) I thought so. I thought, bong. I'm not going anymore. I can't. What did you say to your husband about that? Well, he was relieved. Yeah. And when I told him everything, he said, honey, I thought you knew all of that. I said, no, of course I didn't know all of that. But he had been very patient with me. And he had just been very supportive all along. Yeah. And um, that terrific. so we found a different church to go to. It was a wonderful rock and roll, Bible thumping <laughs> church. And he, the preacher there hooked us up with some ex-Mormons. Oh, okay. An ex-Mormon and his wife, who had yeah. never been Mormon. But he could, re- he could relate to me. He, could, you, he understood where yeah, you were coming from. Yeah. And there was a little was bit of culture shock. Pretty good support for you. Yes. It was wonderful. Yeah. But it's been wonderful ever since because I don't ever ever feel alone anymore even when i am alone because of my relationship with jesus that is so real before it was church structure that kept you church structure protected me yeah because of all the trauma kind of that my family had been through and that i had been through on a personal level and now yeah the the church structure was comforting it was but now it's jesus and and i do believe that he knew my needs and he helped kind of shepherd me very gently until I could handle standing on my own two feet with him. Praise God. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. And so you, and don't you, don't you love the music and the words? I, I love it on the screen when they share the words and it's all about Jesus. Yep. Worship. Um, it is. I mean, you, you just it's all wouldn't about hear, Jesus. you wouldn't sing songs to a man. No. You're, you're worshiping Jesus. And, no. Yeah. You know, we don't praise our pastors. <laughs> no, and there's a freedom. And you know, one of the things that I found interesting, or I guess I should have known, but I didn't assume that the Christians had any regard for family, for, for youth programs, for young yeah, people. We, we were in a church with a wonderful youth program. We've since moved to another church, and uh, we're acclimating to that one. <laughs> but our kids loved it. Our kids went to a wonderful summer camp, yeah. Church summer camp. 
But I mean, um, they have activities yes, and they love their wonderful kids. Wonderful youth and leaders. And wonderful programs. What it's, did the kids think about this transition? Were they of age to to really be entrenched in Mormonism? Did you have a conflict there or anything? There was some culture shock and adjustment, but one of my, I had one daughter still at home, yeah. and when I explained it to her and showed her things, right, yeah. she was relieved and she said, oh mom, I am so glad I don't have to wear garments. <laughs> <laughs> she said that. Well, you know what? We're almost out of time. I wanted to give you a couple of minutes maybe to, to share with us how you now feel about Jesus and grace. And, and I know we've touched on different things, but that positive freedom that you now feel and what the cross means maybe and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I, I, I wear my cross. <laughs> I have my symbol of Jesus. For me, it's a symbol of Jesus. Yeah. I, I have a personal relationship with Jesus that nobody... I don't have to go through anybody yeah. to get to him. He is there with me when I need him. Uh, whether he sends a messenger to me or whether he's right there, it doesn't matter. I'm not alone. And I believe in him. He, he's my savior. Um, and it's wonderful just not to feel alone ever, even when I am alone. Yeah. And do you, uh, in this sense of... Uh, what, what do you say to the Mormons? What would you encourage them to do? I say they're so, you're such good people. You can have, and maybe you feel like you have a personal relationship with Jesus. But let me tell you, especially if you've been through the temple, you do not have to go through a person to get to Jesus. You don't. That is completely unnecessary. Yeah, the veil was rent, right? <laughs> the veil was rent. Yeah. The sacrifice was given. You don't have to be that sacrifice. You just follow him out of love, and you don't have to go through other people. Yeah. Any books you'd recommend them? Yeah, Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus, because, because Muslims raise their children a lot the same way that Mormons do when they talk about the Bible. Oh. And all of the arguments against the Bible are addressed in this book very well <laughs> by this Muslim who became a Christian, and he's a preacher now, uh, Christian well, Sherry, preacher. Sherry, thanks so much for sharing your story, and it's, uh, it's been just fascinating. And, you know, we do, again, we do have a heart for Mormons. We, we just feel like Mormonism is another gospel. And what you were saying when you moved to Nashville, and I think it's true of most Mormons, is that they have a very shallow knowledge. Of Jesus. Of, well, of Jesus for sure <clears throat> and of grace. And but what they he have did. a very sh shallow knowledge of Mormon doctrine yes. and Mormon history. That's true. And when you start studying, then you learn and realize that there's a significant problem. There was no need for a restoration. That's and right. that you can rest and trust in Jesus. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Well, again, thank you. Safe travels. Thank you so much. We'll see you next for time. Being here.